Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. The Sunshine Policy. The idea that South Korea should approach North Korea through dialogue, cooperation, and reconciliation has been highly contentious ever since its inception in the late 1990s. Its initiator, former President Kim Dae-jung, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for reaching out to Pyongyang. At the same time, however, critics have rendered the Sunshine Policy as naive appeasement with a dangerous dictatorship. Even today, the dispute about the right foreign policy approach towards North Korea splits the South Korean political discourse. One of the leading experts on the Sunshine Policy is Chong In Moon. For this episode, we spoke to him about the history of this policy, whether or not it failed, and his opinions about how South Korea and the international community should approach North Korea. Chong In Moon is Professor of Political Science at Yonsei University and Editor-in-Chief of Global Asia. He is also Executive Director of the Kim Dae-jung Presidential Library and Museum and previously served as Dean of Yonsei's Graduate School of International Studies. Previously, under former President No Mu Hyun, Professor Moon also served as Chairman of the Presidential Committee on Northeast Asian Cooperation Initiative, and was ambassador for international security affairs on behalf of the South Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Professor Chong In Moon, welcome to Korea and the World. Why did you become so invested in the Sunshine Policy? Because it is a good policy. The Sunshine Policy has three basic principles. First principle is that the South Korean government, the Kim Dae-jung government, will not tolerate any military provocation by North Korea. The second principle is that the South Korean government does not have any intention to achieve unification through absorption. And third one is to promote exchange and cooperation in such a way to achieve de facto unification in which people, goods and services can freely move. You just mentioned de facto unification. How is it different from what could be a de jure uh, unification? De jure unification usually means that the unification under one sovereignty either in the form of one single unified nation state or federation or confederation. But de facto unification means European Union type union of states, union of North South Korean states. Therefore, it is predicated on the existence of two sovereignty, yet promote exchange and cooperation, enhance peaceful coexistence, and to come up with some kinds of institutional arrangement for union of two separate states. Practically, what steps should be taken? They can have summit talks, and they can institutionalize summit talks, and also they can institutionalize ministerial talks and parliamentary talks. Those are the basic things, and they can come up with a comprehensive agreement for the promotion of exchange and cooperation between North and South. Critics have frequently connected the Sunshine Policy with the idea of appeasement, which, well, in turn has been linked to giving in to the Nazi regime just before World War II. Do you understand this criticism? Is it a valid one? It's a nonsensical criticism. The strong never make an appeasement. Only the weak shows an appeasement. Obviously, in South Korea under the Kim Dae-jung government was stronger than North Korea. Therefore, it's not an appeasement. It was a policy for engagement with North Korea. At the same time, there have been criticism that the government just gave unilateral benefits to North Korea without actually having anything in return. That's a nonsensical argument, too. If you look at the so-called progressive decade in the Kim Dae-jung and Nomian governments, they were altogether about 8.4 trillion won set aside for inter-Korean cooperation fund. Out of 8.4 trillion won, almost 4 trillion won went to the construction of Shinpo light water nuclear reactor in North Korea. In other words, almost half of the cooperation fund went to the project which was initiated by Kim Young sam But what about the cash for summit scandal when it was discovered that President Kim Dae-jung had provided North Korea with millions of dollars in order to secure the 2000 North-South summit that actually resulted in its Nobel Prize? What's wrong with it? It's a presidential decision. You know, the $400 million which was paid by Hyundai Asan to North Korea, it's just a very typical business transactions in order to have concessions over Mount Gumgang area, Kaesong, and back to Mountain. They had a 50 years concession of those three in the sites, and they paid the first installment of the, in the concession fee. That is a 400 in a million dollars. Then, problematic one is 100 million dollars. President Kim argues that uh, 100 million dollars was uh, in a presidential decision. 
to buy peace and to promote exchange and cooperation with North Korea, even to have a summit. Therefore, and the President Kim argues that it is his personal decision. Okay. On the other hand, as to $400 million, which Hyundai, Hyundai paid, our Supreme Court made a verdict. It is Beijing's transaction. And now let us go back to the Inter-Korean Cooperation Fund. Out of the $8 trillion, $4 trillion went to that the construction of simple light water nuclear reactor okay, as a principal and interest. And among the remainder, about $2.7 trillion won went to the shipment of rice and fertilizer. It was not just outright giving. It was the so-called loans. We give North Korea first, then when North Korea can pay back, and they should pay back. North Korea still has outstanding debt. There is not unilateral giving. Several hundred billion won were used to what? Used to the construction of railroad between Bunsan and you know, Kaesong, and between Kosong and Mount Gumgang. Therefore, you know, if you really make a very concrete analysis of the actual fund to be used, there's nothing unilateral giving. It's a conservative in a gimmick. It is very, very unfair. Those conservative critics know about it very well, yet they you know, sensationalize in such a way to demean and undermine you know, Kim Dae-jung and Nomi Hyun initiative. It's very sad. Even Americans are really taking that argument because in accordance with the South Korean law, there is no other way to give them money. Even those who have transferred of $100 million, Park ji and NSA, they all were punished by the law. Other items, other so-called official inter-Korean cooperation fund, they should get approval from the National Assembly. Therefore, there's nothing wrong. Even the then opposition party, the currently ruling party members, they are all approved. If there is nothing wrong legally with that move, there have been some concerns emitted by uh, different speakers, well, one of them being a uh, North Korean defector and writer, Kang chol Hwan, mm-hmm. um, who wrote 10 years ago that uh, there might be some moral concerns with it, with the fact that maybe the sunshine policies and engagement policies would just bolster the North Korean government and essentially allow it to continue exploiting and oppressing its own people. That's his view, but it's the wrong view. He's morally wrong too. Because why? Because we want to help North Korean people. How can you help North Korean people without having contact and dialogue and negotiation with North Korean authorities? That's a nonsensical argument. North Korea is a sovereign state. It has authorities. And without going through them, how can we help North Korean people? They're therefore talking nonsense. Then, you know, Kang chol and others would argue that the North Korean authority is not authority. It is fictional argument. Reality is they are well and alive. And our concern is how to improve basic human needs of North Korean people. We hope the North Koreans would get the rice, fertilizers, medical supplies, and others. Therefore, let us to be very, very realistic. Let us not make a nonsensical point for the sake of argument. In your opinion, what would you say are the noteworthy accomplishments of the Sunshine Policy? At least during the Sunshine Policy, there was heightened tension on the Korean Peninsula. And there was a dialogue, and we had a contact. Of course, there are you know, two naval crashes in the West Sea. That really shows the, how you know, precarious the tension on the Korean pension is. And that is the reason why we should have a more close contact with North Korea and have a consultative mechanism with North Korea. Obviously, the Sunshine Policy has not worked. I mean, there's no unification yet. But can we really say that it has failed, in your opinion? There is no other option but Sunshine Policy. Because Sunshine Policy engagement. And other options, you could say that isolation, containment, and overthrow of the regime. It is proven that that is not working. Another one is a military option. We cannot take a military option. Of course, you can combine both sticks and carrots. And we have all learned that it is not working. Engagement policy or sunshine policy, a policy for reconciliation and cooperation, are the only options. And also, there is some unfair aspect. If you look at the sunshine history of sunshine policy, from June to December 2000, therefore altogether a five months period, in a six months period, and October to December 2007, two months period, therefore altogether about the eight to nine months period, were the period for sunshine policy. Other than that, because of tension between Washington and Pyongyang, and because of North Korean nuclear fiasco, the South Korean government could not pursue the engagement policy as it wished. Therefore, you got to talk about just nine months sunshine policy. What can you expect? If it were prolonged, let's say three, four, five years, and then it didn't produce any outcome, then sunshine policy should be criticized and discarded. 
just less than one year experiment. What can you expect? It's a really premature critique of the sunshine policy. So you would essentially say that there have been exogenous factors that have affected the success of the sunshine policy, like the United States and other crises. Is, is that right? That's true. The United States, the Bush administration, was a real cause of undermining the sunshine policy. If the United States engaged as the Clinton administration did, then there could be no second nuclear testing, no nuclear fast, even no missile testing and whatever. Recently, we interviewed Professor Victor Cha, who had a somewhat positive view of President Bush's approach to North Korea, especially President Bush's focus on the human rights issue in North Korea. Do you share that? That's, that's damn wrong. You cannot achieve all. Listen to President Obama's speech recently with regard to Iranian deal, Iranian nuclear deal, what he said. Yes, Iran is a violator of human rights and democracy. Iran has been supporting terrorist organizations. Iran has been undermining the stability in the Gulf area, and etc. But most important thing is the nuclear issue. That is why we paid attention to nuclear issue. That is the way the American government is supposed to pursue it. The whole the Victor Trust Hawk engagement, that's a nonsense. You, know, you cannot take all, even the United States. You cannot eat the cake and have it. You cannot. You, even U.S. cannot do that. What is important right now is the denuclearization of North Korea. Then South Korea, the United States, China, all concerned parties should pay the all attention to the resolution of nuclear issue. If you mingle your nuclear wish with human rights and opening and reform of North Korea, all those things, nothing will happen. The situation get worsened. So there should be an order, a list of things that should come first, and for you it's nuclear first. Nuclear first, naturally. Suppose you raise the issue of human rights at the same time the nuclear issues, then North Korea will, will never give up nuclear issues. North Korea will never give up its nuclear one. North Korea perceived human rights offensive by the United States as a way of uh, shaking the North Korean regime and toppling the North Korean regime. Then why the hell North Korea would give up the nuclear weapons? That a big Cha kind of approach really screwed up. It seems that the United States are important when dealing with North Korea, but at the same time, it's not that interested in North Korea at the moment. And looking backward, North Korea as well seems interested in only dealing with the US. So how can South Korea actually try to move forward when the two crucial interlocutors are not actually communicating with each other? That's a very good point. The South Korean initiative is very, very important. Look, how the Perry process studied and became successful because of South Korean intervention. There was a very close coordination between Seoul and Washington on how to engage with North Korea. And whenever William Perry visited Pyongyang, he came back, he made a full consultation with the South Korean officials during the Kim Dae-jung government. In that way, there could be a full coordination between Washington and Seoul. That is how that Perry process became successful. Therefore, right now, it is the same thing. I personally hope that President Obama would take the second Perry process. But it would be very difficult for President Obama to take that kind of posture because he has a feeling of betrayal and distrust over North Korea. Why is that? Where does such feelings come now, from? Two things. You know, first is when he was about to give a nuclear weapons free world in Praha on April 5, 2009, and North Korea just test launched the rocket early in the morning. And that really disappointed President Obama. The second one is the famous Leap Day Agreement, February 29th Agreement of 2012. At the time, you know, Ambassador Glenn Davis you know, reported to President Obama. The deal went very well, and North Korea will be suspending nuclear testing and uh, missile test launching, and etc. But a week later, they announced that the, in the test launching of a rocket. But the way I understand is that there was no such a full agreement. When I met the North Koreans, They told me that they never agreed to ban the test launching of rocket, but uh, Glenn Davis perceived it in a different way. That was a source of fiasco. Again, that was you know, the second reason why you know, President Obama was so angry about North Korea. But despite all these kinds of discord, I personally hope that uh, President Obama pays attention to North Korea and try to solve the North Korean problem. There has been a narrative saying that the United States actually do not want to solve the North Korean issue because it provides a very convenient excuse or justification to keep troops in the region, thereby balancing against China without actually having to say so. It is very unfortunate to have that kind of perception, but a growing number of South Koreans began to understand in that way because the United States need North Korean nuclear fiasco. 
so that the United States can maintain its forces in South Korea and thereby uh, you know, balance and contain China. But I personally hope it is not true, but a growing number of South Koreans began to think in that way, and that is very unfortunate. As you mentioned, the Sunshine Policy didn't really last that long, but soon enough, with the presidency of Im Yong Bak, he actually lost any support. What was the policy that uh, President Im Yong Bak uh, supported when coming? No, he called you know two basic policies. One is so-called uh, denuclearize North Korea, denuke open three thousand policy. That means what well, if North Korea give up its nuclear weapons, then South Korea will be supporting North Korea in such a way to achieve per capita income of three thousand dollar per capita income within a decade. That is one policy. Another policy is so called grain by bargaining strategy. That means if North Korea does not show up, six party talk, then other remaining five countries get together, gang up and try to come up with kinds of punitive measures on North Korea. Did it work? Both, did both didn't work at all. Both didn't work at all. In fact, the Im Young Bak government, North Korea, undertook the second nuclear testing, and the Six Party Tung never uh, resumed, and also this Five Party coordination never took place. But underlying all this thing is, Im Young Bak government's basic premise was that the North Korean regime will not last long. Therefore, if anything happens in North Korea or contingency happens in North Korea, the allocate U.S. combined forces would intervene in North Korea and stabilize North Korea and then achieve unification by absorption. But the premise was wrong and nothing happened. Inter-Korean relations get worsened. It seems that in South Korea there is somewhat of a division between conservatives and progressive. The former are white hardliners, whereas the later are more, well, obviously softliners. Do you think that's a fair perception of the South Korean situation? And what could actually be done to get both groups to cooperate on the North Korean issue. It's very difficult to form a consensus between the two lines of thought. Because there is one you know, philosophical difference. The philosophical difference comes from the fact that the hardline conservatives argue that the North Korea is a demon. North Korea is an, an object to be crushed. There is no room for dialogue and negotiation with North Korea. The more we engage with North Korea, the more North Koreans will be suffering. Okay? And North Korean regime will be enjoying it. That's morally wrong. But on the other hand, the liberals or progressives argue that no matter how demonic North Korean regime is, let us have a talk. What is important is peace. Even we can achieve peace by talking and engaging with so-called demonic North Korea. There, there is a fundamental difference between the two. And do you have any idea of the steps that could be taken, practically speaking? No, the most important thing is a reorientation of our way of thinking. The hardline conservative argues that the Korean fate depends upon the patterns of interaction between China and the United States. Balance of power determinism works. And therefore, what is important is, is for South Korea to convince Beijing and Washington to work with us. And then after then, we talk with North Korea. But I think that approach is wrong. Therefore, South Korea should take a more proactive role and engage with North Korea and solve the Korean problem then we, we, there is no need for us to rely on the United States for military protection. The reduced dependency on the alliance with the United States will expand the scope of our maneuver. Then our relationship with China will be bettered, and then China will be, China can engage in North Korea in, in much more flexible way. Then there can be a, some kind of virtuous cycle of peace, prosperity, and coexistence. But there is a contending paradigms between the two. But I personally support the liberal slash progressive view. Moving on to today, in contrast to the Sunshine Policy, President Park has adopted a policy called Trust Politic. How is it different from the Sunshine Policy, and how does it actually compare to it? In a sense, same, identical. How so? I mean, you would expect a conservative president to have a different approach. How are they similar? President Park Geun-hye has a learning effect from the Im Young-bak government. Of course, President Park Geun-hye you know, she would like to come up with some kind of synthesis, progressive government's you know, engagement policy and Im Young Bak government's hardline policy. But the Korean Peninsula trust process itself is very liberal prescription. You got to have trust, and then trust can enhance exchange and cooperation. Then exchange and cooperation will lead to the peaceful coexistence between North and South, and then we can then create the virtuous cycle of peace and prosperity. In the sense, you know, very similar. 
between Park Geun-hye's view and Kim Dae-jung and Noh-myeon's view. So she's essentially promoting a reunification by consensus as well. Oh, sure. At least in, in written record, she has been championing the unification by consensus. The reason is very simple, you know, because she has proposed so-called you know, unification preparation. And there are three basic elements of unification preparation. First element is, uh, let us form the domestic consensus on how to achieve unification. And second, we got to talk with North Korea and try to come up with some kind of consensual unification. And third, wish to get the international support. But those are the three major components of the unification in a preparation. But in the sense, it's a very similar to the progressive ideas. Last year, President Park has said that the reunification could be Dongil Tebak, or roughly translated in English, a bonanza. Do you agree with that view? Yes. But it all depends upon what kinds of unification. If it is a consensual unification through incremental engagement with North Korea, then it will be a bonanza, Tebak. But if, it, if unification takes place in the form of absorption in a military conflict, then it will be disaster. I agree with President Park's you know, basic argument that unification is bonanza, but she hasn't really defined what kinds of unification. But the way I read her speeches and whatever, she was referring to unification by consensus. Then that means basically in a uh, union of North South Korean states. And in that case, it will be you know, bonanza. How has North Korea reacted to President Park's policy for the moment? For the moment, North Korea perceived President Park Geun-hye's policy as a policy for unification by absorption, what they call the Jedo Tongin, institutional unification, and Chejie Tongin, regime unification. Therefore, it appears to me that North Korea regards Park Geun-hye's policy as an extension or continuation of Im Young-bo policy. Over a year ago, the Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights in North Korea reported findings and strongly accused the North Korean leadership of severe crimes against humanity. Doesn't public criticism like that make a return to a very strong sunshine policy unlikely? Uh, both because a soft position might not gather support of the public and the international community, but also because, well, it openly criticizes North Korea. No, not necessarily in Korea. Internationally, maybe, but uh, in South Korea, a lot of people are concerned uh, about the trade off between human rights and peace. If we push too hard on human rights issues, then North Korea will be much more alarmed, okay, and North Korea will be willing to take a military action in order to protect their regime. Therefore, there is a trade off between human rights and peace. Another big issue is that there is a trade off between human rights and basic human needs. Suppose if we pursue with hardline human rights policy in North Korea, then North Korea will be refused to take any humanitarian assistance to us. Right now, that is taking place. Then who will be victims of that inner phenomenon? Just ordinary North Korean people. Therefore, there is a trade off between the two. And third one is, that, let us be more realistic. Has the U.S. or even United Nations been ever successful changing human rights status or democracy in other countries through the sanctions and other kinds of policy measures. And they incite the South Africa. South Africa is a different story. At least South Africa was an open economy. IBM, Coca-Cola, all day get into South Africa. They're pretty easy. But in North Korea, it's a complete closed one. What is really important is let North Korea have opening and reform market mechanism so that they can have a civil society and the middle class. When the time comes, then there can be change from within. Therefore, what we have to do is we should try to come up with international milieu that can foster or encourage North Korea to take an opening and reform market system and to have expanded civil society. That is what we have to do. The Helsinki Accords essentially helped that in with the Soviet Union by allowing the civil society to speak up. But North Korea has access to that data and knows that an increase in civil society, an increase of liberties would actually be detrimental to its own government. If you say that we want to change you, then North Korea will never change you. We simply say, okay, regime type is none of our business, your own business. But we are concerned about your economic conditions. We want to do, interact with you economically. We are not going to invade you. Then have opening and reform. Have a market system. Then whether we want or not, North Korea will be having new expanded civil society, even rise of middle class in very short time period. Then North Korean citizens will be calling for it. But right now, there is no civil society at all. 
is a political society called the Korea Workers Party controls everything. Under that circumstance, it is extremely difficult for us to expect any kind of improvements in human rights. Of course, I'm not denying the utility of international pressures. They should go. But the, such a kind of international pressure cannot resolve North Korean human rights issue and democracy. One issue that will come up in the context of unification is that of transitional justice and of the prosecution of those who have committed crimes against humanity in the name of North Korea. Do you have an insight of how South Korea would deal with that? Would they just get a free get-out-of-jail card or would they actually be prosecuted? And how do you draw the line between the guilty ones and those who aren't? That traditional justice is worse than human rights approach. It's a whole legalist in a fictional world. And then North Koreans handle Why international organization intervene? Total, I would say it's total nonsense. For the sake of legalist studies, for the sake of international fad, they're doing it. But when there's a change in government in North Korea, regime in North Korea, they all handle it. North Korea is not a stupid country. North Korea is not so-called the third world in an independent country. The traditional justice, I know it's a universal appeal, but it's really product of so-called Western arrogance. Then North Korean people handle it. Then those North Koreans you know, set up their own tribunal and then punish who are responsible. Why third party intervene? But there is all assume the unification by absorption. Now there's a contingency in North Korea, chaos in North Korea, then international peacekeeping operation, United Nations would intervene it, and then they will set up the tribunal court and then you are wrong, okay, you should go to jail, or you, you are okay, you stay out of the jail. That's a nonsense. It's a, what an arrogant approach. The current zeitgeist uh, seems to be that China is the key to resolving the North Korean issue. At the same time, and for a few years now, China has been hinting that it may well be fed up with the rogue state. Is that truly the case? And should South Korea actually try to pursue the China path? That's another stupid idea and stupid approach. China is not the key. United States is the key. If United States remove its hostile intended policy, against North Korea. Things can be solved very easily. That's why China is so angry about the United States. Chinese people argue the root cause of the Korean problem is American, American policy. If America changes its policy on North Korea, things can be resolved very easily. Why North Korea is having nuclear weapons? Because North Koreans are in fear of American nuclear attack. Then Americans say, would say that, oh, that's a nonsense, it's a fictional. And North Koreans are doing that for the sake of regime security. But if you talk with the North Koreans in Pyongyang, their fear of American nuclear attack is real. Therefore, China has been arguing that the United States make the things more screwed up, yet trying to outsource it to China. China is not dumb. A year ago, the current mayor of Seoul, Park won soon has been quoted as saying that he'd advocate a return to the sunshine policy and meetings with the North Korean leadership. Is that merely populist talk? Or might this be actually a feasible option uh, with maybe a different president? I see more than feasible. Even current president, President Park Geun-hye, can have a summit with North Korea if she lift, you know, May 21st, you know, related sanctions and resume the Mount Gumgang tourist project. And if she, she really shows the real science of, you know, improving ties with North Korea, Kim Jong Un will come out. It doesn't matter whether he's so-called liberal political leaders or not. What really matters is actual policy. If there are real changes in policy, and then there will be real changes in inter-Korean relations, therefore summit talk can be possible. Do you think that this type of policy would actually be a platform to run for presidency for the next mandate? Can someone who would actually promote that as the core tenant of their campaign actually be successful, you think? Yeah, I think so. I think Korea is still divided. I would say the half conservative, half liberals, particularly the president's candidate from the opposition party, will be running on this sunshine policy platform, and the candidate from the ruling party will be running on the you know, policy that criticizes and denies the sunshine policy. So to conclude, what about yourself? Do you still believe that the sunshine policy was and is still the best option when dealing with North Korea? And where do you see your future role in this? There's no other option but the sunshine policy, because sunshine policy is all about engagement with North Korea. No matter how demanding North Korea, without engaging, you cannot find the peaceful solution. Therefore, my basic position is this. I don't want war on the Korean Peninsula, period. I don't want the human sufferings in North Korea anymore. Those are the two most important mandates for me.
Then engagement, reconciliation, cooperation, and the sunshine policy is the real option. If opposition party wins the next president election, I'll have some role. If ruling party wins, I don't have any options but criticizing the government policy. Professor Chong In Moon, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.